Um, so, okay, I'm glad to introduce today's speaker, my friend Alexander Alexander Trenin from Imperial College London, who will tell us something about multi-armed bandits. So, Alex, please. So, hello everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Um, my name is uh, Alex Trenin. I'm based at Imperial College London. Um, and this tutorial is not about my work. Um, this tutorial is about uh, presenting some uh, really classical theory by now uh, on multi-armed bandits and explore exploit. Um, this theory is a basic building block of uh, algorithms, many algorithms in reinforcement learning. And it's kind of uh, interesting in its own right. So this is really about presenting the key ideas. Um, I will focus on um, ideas more than on formalism. And uh, the idea is that if you understand the ideas, you can figure out the fine details of the formalism. Um, I also won't be completely comprehensive and present everything one would want to present because that would take too much time. So, um, I'll focus, for example, on um, the precise problem setup, why it's formalized the way that it is, and how kind of basic techniques of analysis for most uh, algorithms proceed. So that's uh, that's the that's kind of the preview. And with that said, let me go ahead and get started. So this tutorial is on multi-armed bandits. Um, now, what is a multi-armed bandit? Um, this is sort of a, almost a famously obscure uh, problem name. And uh, multi-armed bandit uh, really comes from a casino analogy. Uh, and the casino analogy works like this. Um, you're at a casino and in front of you is a multi-armed bandit which is a 1950s era American name for a slot machine. And if you went to the casino nowadays, um, I don't think I've been in a casino once since becoming old enough to go. Um, but if I had, I'd, I, if I had, I've walked kind of past them. Um, and I would imagine that nowadays slot machines have buttons that you press um, but back in the 1950s, apparently they had arms that you could pull. And so the idea is, <clears throat> is that in front of you is a slot machine and you pull one of the arms. And after pulling the arm, you receive a certain amount of reward. For example, a certain amount of money. Um, and uh, different arms will have different rewards. And uh, so the question basically is, which one do you pull? Uh, assuming there is some kind of fixed cost to play and we kind of don't really worry about the costs. Uh, we try to, we want, we want to talk about maximizing the reward that you are going to receive from the multi-armed bandit. And so this problem is interesting because a priori, you don't know what the reward is for each arm. Um, this is something that uh, you need to learn by interacting with the bandit. Now we assume that uh, there's uh, the rewards sort of don't depend on the order in which you play and they don't depend on kind of how hard you pull the arm. It's just uh, independent, identically distributed rewards, one for each arm, but unknown to the user. So that's the problem setup. Um, I will describe the form of the precise formalization of this problem in a moment. Um, but for now, I want to again consider pulling different arms and receiving different rewards. And I want to illustrate this, this and uh, what kind of behavior happens a little bit better. So imagine these vertical lines represent the amount of reward that's received in each arm. And so we're going to just try playing the bandit and seeing kind of what, what happens. So first we pull the first arm and we receive some reward. And then we say, well, we've never tried the other two arms. 
So let's try the other two arms and imagine you receive these rewards. And you say to yourself, well, okay, maybe the third one is better. Then you play it again, you get this reward. Uh, and then you say, okay, so maybe the third one isn't actually better. Maybe, maybe I don't like it because it's sort of very risky. I might get more reward, but I might get a lot less reward. So what if I try the first arm? Well, it, I get this reward, which is sort of, I don't know, not very promising. And then you try the second arm, you get something better than what you first saw. Uh, because recall again, the rewards are random for each, for each arm. And so you sort of try the blue one again and you get, you get something like this. So the question here is, well, what, what should you do? What should the strategy be for how you select the arms based on the observed rewards, which are represented here by the vertical position of the dots, one of each color? And the question is, what do you do? Uh, and the purpose really of this tutorial is to show you the necessary techniques of analysis so that you can ask and answer that question. Um, and not necessarily answer everything about the question, but answer enough about it to sort of get started in some quite interesting theory. So that's the introduction. Um, and so now let's talk about formalism. So the formalism for this problem um, is going to be as follows. Uh, we have a function. Um, it's a function that uh, takes as input a, an abstract, an element of an abstract set x uh, and gives you back a real number between 0 and 1. Now for this talk, uh, X is going to be a finite set with cardinality K. And X is going to be thought of as representing the indices of the arms. So there's going to be a single element in X, one for every arm. And so for the previous example, we would have had K is equal to three. Um, and for this talk, I've, I'm also assuming that the true rewards are bounded. Um, they're between zero and one. I don't have to assume that, uh, but if I don't assume that, then the analysis is very similar, but it's more technical. Uh, and this it will become clear why in a couple of slides. So for purposes of, of presenting the simplest setting uh, that I can show you, I'm going to stick to uh, bounded rewards. Um, and this turns out not to really matter that much as far as the key ideas go. Um, it sort of doesn't take too much extra work to do much more general case. So we're not losing very much in terms of ideas by restricting to that. And the goal here is to compute the maxima of the function f of x, um, which uh, I've described here. And uh, the, so this right now looks just like an optimization problem. And uh, it's kind of clear from the previous, uh, um, from the previous uh, picture that we're not talking about an optimization problem. We're talking about something richer. And so I have to give you the final condition, which is that you don't actually observe um, the, the function uh, f of, xt for every time step. And uh, because you don't observe the function, you, you need to learn it based on data. And your data is the noisy observations, uh, which are corrupted by uh, some noise that's epsilon. And epsilon here is a random variable. So again, your goal is to maximize the function f in this setting, but you don't observe it. You don't get to see f. Instead, you get to see f plus epsilon, where epsilon is a random variable. Um, and I'm actually going to assume that it's a centered random variable. So in other words, that the, um, the mean of epsilon is zero. 
Um, I'm also going to assume that epsilon uh, for every index is iid random. Um, so in other words, if I choose a different x of t, so epsilon, I, let's say epsilon x, x1 and epsilon x2, if x1 and x2 are the same, then the distribution of epsilon x1 and epsilon x2 are the same. So that's, that's the problem setting. Um, I will stay a little, say a little bit more about these ideas in subsequent slides. And so the question here is, uh, what's, the, what's the strategy? You know, what, what should you do? So given observations f of x t up to time t, uh, how are you going to choose uh, x of t plus one? So how do you choose a next arm given what you've seen before? So, okay, um, that's a question we can ask. And uh, in order to answer the question, I need to give you uh, a little bit more definitions. And uh, the reason for these definitions that I need to give you is because we don't have a, a, a way yet of comparing different strategies. So if I have a strategy and you have a different strategy, then we don't, we, we don't know how to compare those strategies. We don't know who who's gonna have a better strategy. And so I need to introduce an appropriate notion that allows you to evaluate strategies and see which one's better. And there might be different notions for this, uh, but the notion that I'm going to focus on is uh, regret, uh, frequentist regret. And uh, that notion is uh, just given here. It's very simple. The regret of a strategy that I'm leaving implicit in the notation up to time capital T is just the sum between f of x star, which is the reward for x star minus the reward for xt. Um, and uh, as you might've guessed from the notation, x star is the argmax of f. And so in particular, um, this notion of regret, um, I mean, some people think of this as actually as the expected regret, and this is the case where you kind of formulate everything in terms of f plus epsilon instead of f, but I've opted to do it this way because I think it's simpler and it's equivalent. Um, and so what does this mean? What's the idea? Well, the idea is, what if you knew what the best arm was? What if there's an oracle that just told you what the best arm is? Well, then you're, you're never going to pick the other arms. You're just going to play the best arm over and over again, because you know it's the best one. Why would you bother with the other ones? You know for a fact it's the best one. Um, but in reality, you don't know what the best one is. And so you're going to compare the arm that you choose with your strategy with uh, what the amount of reward you would have gotten if you've just played the best arm over and over. And that's regret. So regret is essentially how much reward do you lose because you didn't actually know the uh, best arm to play and uh, as, as a consequence of not knowing the best arm to play, uh, you know, you end up uh, basically selecting some, some other arm and receiving less reward. So um, as a, so that's basically the setting. And uh, the point to make here is that different strategies yield different values of regret. Um, and uh, because they yield different values of regret, uh, you can have uh, like very different performance. And so what regret does is it gives us a way to evaluate different strategies and determine which one is preferable. Now, before I proceed, I might mention alternatives you might have to this notion. Um, you can have a discounted regret where you sort of weigh the, the reward for times that are closer to the time that we're thinking about more than rewards in the future. Um, and that would give you a slightly different theory. Um, 
And so the so, so this is not the only possible choice. You can also have kind of Bayesian versions of this where you take this regret and then you integrate it against some prior distribution. And so that, that's another choice. And all of these choices will yield uh, slightly different forms of analysis. Uh, but the overall character, the overall kind of behavior will be very similar for different notions. And so that's why I present this one, because it's one of the simplest ones one can choose. So that's what regret is. Um, and now I want to just come back to the illustration that I showed earlier. Um, the illustration here is now displaying what is the underlying distribution of rewards for each arm. And you can see from this distribution kind of that in expectation, the blue arm is better than the red arm. Um, I mean, I think everybody can agree that that has higher expected value than the red arm. And remember that the function f that we have is the expected value of those distributions. Um, but then there's the orange arm whose expectation is actually just a little bit lower than uh, of the blue arm. So the blue arm here is the, is the optimal arm, but this is not obvious because of the different variants. Um, and so because of this, um, you get an explore exploit trade-off in particular because you don't actually know what that distribution is. You don't get to see that curve. Uh, instead, you only get to see these points. And so there's a character in trying to act optimally in this scenario that involves using the information that you already know because you've seen data for it. On the one hand, that's sort of exploiting the best arm. But you also need to try other options try and try other arms yeah, because they might be better. Because what, what if you just have, what if you've just been unlucky when you use that arm and that one's actually better? And so resolving the multi-armed bandit problem is really an exercise in balance uh, because you need to balance what you know with what you don't know. Um, and you need to balance essentially reward with learning. And uh, the purpose of setting up the formalism I showed you previously is because that formalism enables you to think about uh, different ways of uh, resolving that. So then having said this, uh, the next order of business is to ask, well, what's even possible? Uh, is there limitations that uh, are there for, for any algorithm? I mean, how well can an algorithm do, even in principle, if you don't know what the rewards are? I mean, if you knew what the rewards are, then it's sort of trivial what to do. Uh, but if you don't know what, what the distribution of the rewards is, then, well, how, how well is it even possible to, to do? And for that, I will present a theorem the theorem says that for any algorithm, there is a reward and, and there is a reward distribution, I'm kind of leaving that implicit here, such that the expected regret is uh, asymptotically lower bounded by square root number of arms times than the amount of time that you're gonna consider. So, this tells us immediately that you're never, you're, you're not going to have, you're, you're always going to have regret. Um, there, there is no algorithm for which uh, you incur, say, constant regret or zero regret. Well, the only algorithm that incurs zero regret is if you already know the answer and you don't know the answer. So you're always going to incur some regret no matter what you do. And that's. Um, I'm a, sorry, the, the, the asymptotic phase with respect to T. Is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah. the asymptotics here are with respect to T. Thank you very much. Um, in the, the omega asymptotics in particular. Uh, there, if you really want to get technical with this, um, depending on the precise details of your bandit, for example, like whether your rewards are bounded, how many arms, etc., there might be there might be a requirement um, in certain settings on K being large enough. Um, I mean, certainly K needs to be bigger than two for this statement to be interesting. And I'm kind of leaving these details out, 
Um, and if you're interested in those details, uh, I'm gonna have some books at the very end that can, uh, that you can, you can look at to sort of get like all those very minor details that would make the talk far too long if I, if I presented them. Um, but thank you very much for the question. The, so these asymptotics are with respect to large time. Um, and so you're, no matter what strategy you have, no matter what algorithm you use, you're always gonna incur some level of regret and it's unavoidable. And the point is, is that you're incurring that regret because you're learning. Uh, because you didn't know what the optimal arm was. And so in order to learn, you need to try out sort of enough options and there's sort of many different arms, but there's only one optimal arm. So you have to try out enough arms uh, in order to find out what the best one is and uh, the, the rate at which uh, you're lower bounded is square root for this setup. Now, if you change the assumptions of the problem, you might actually get a different rate. Um, for example, if you consider uh, not a finite armed bandit, but um, generalization with infinitely many arms, then typically the rate will be different from this one. And in other Walkers? generalizations, yes. the rate will, will also differ. Uh, did, was that a question or was that echo? Yes, yes. Right? So what is K? K is the number of arms. Thank you for the question. So K is the number of arms, uh, AKA the size of the set X, which is assumed finite for this talk. So um, before I continue, I wanna just say a little bit about how one proves this. Um, and actually, I don't want to say very much about how one proves this. I want to say only a tiny bit. And the tiny bit that I wanna say is that it involves uh, ideas from uh, information theory. So in particular, you start thinking about, um, well, you say something like, well, if I have an algorithm that does well on this bandit, then I'm gonna construct a different bandit that it's gonna do badly on. And I'm gonna use uh, ideas from information theory in order to kind of make that argument precise. So things like kolbach leibler divergences and th these sorts of things. So that's the, the and, and you know, appropriate inequalities in that setting too. So that's the, that's the, that's, and that's all I want to say theoretically about this. So if you're interested, have a look at the books because uh, they do a good job at presenting this, this idea. And the reason I don't want to say much about it is because I actually want to focus on upper bounds for regret rather than lower bounds. And uh, in order to do that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you first the idea for how you're going to construct a kind of a good algorithm for this problem. And in order to give, the, give you that idea, I need to present an auxiliary result, which is uh, Hufting's inequality. So you have an IID sequence of random variables y1 through yt with values in uh, the unit interval. Uh, we let y bar of t be the sample mean of the, the y, the y's. And then the following inequality holds. So the probability that the true expectation of the y's is bigger than the sample mean plus a uh, constant delta is a uh, squared exponential rate uh, with respect to delta and uh, exponential uh, with respect to the number of random variables. And so that's a result. Uh, I'm not. I'm definitely not going to talk about how you prove that result. Um, but that's that. That's a result, and that's a result that we can use. Uh, and in particular, the result is one of a class of many, many more general results that are called concentration inequalities. And they're called concentration inequalities because this is really about how the distribution of uh, things like uh, empirical means of a collection of random variables is usually much narrower than the distribution of the random variables themselves. Uh, and this relates to things to, and, 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 so, and so this is a basic concentration inequality. And if the setting that we had was different, say we didn't assume that our bandits uh, 
ob observations were between zero and one, we assumed they were real, then we would need a different concentration inequality. And so that's why I restrict to that setting because uh, that's the sim that's the sim si simple inequality without sort of too many things going on and too many requirements and too many conditions. And so concentration inequalities are very nice because they enable us to construct error bars. Uh, in particular, I can, if I assume that the observed data f of xt plus epsilon of xt satisfy Hupting's inequality, then I can choose delta on the previous slide and a parameter eta that I'm going to introduce here in order that the following inequality holds. Um, I can choose those constants so that the absolute difference between y bar of t, which I'm going to define now as f of xt plus epsilon of xt, so y bar of t is now the observed data that I'm going to see. Uh, and uh, the true mean of y bar of t, again, is f. And that's because I've assumed that the uh, errors are mean 0 uh, uh, at the beginning. And uh, I can choose the constant delta and the constant eta to make this hold. Uh, and the reason for this particular choice, and I need to tell you what those uh, symbols are. First, I'm going to call the term that's on the right-hand side of the inequality inside the probability. Uh, I'm going to call that term sigma because that's the width of the error bars. So on the left-hand side, we have the difference between the empirical mean and the true reward for an arm. And on the right-hand side is the sigma. That's the uh, width of the error bars. And I have to tell you what the rest of the symbols mean. nt of x is the expected number of times uh, the arm x is selected by uh, the algorithm. And y bar of t, as I mentioned again, is the empirical mean of f of x t plus epsilon. That is a typo. There should be a plus epsilon at the at the bottom. Uh, please excuse the typo. I thought I caught all the typos yesterday, but I guess I didn't. Hopefully, that's the only one. So y bar of t is the empirical mean of f of x t plus epsilon up to time t. And so the point of this is that I essentially have an inequality on my observed data from the true rewards that depends on what I've seen and how many times I've observed each arm. Now you can ask why you choose that value for sigma. And the answer is, uh, well, at first I leave an abstract value uh, in place and just leave it in terms of some, just to, in terms of sigma. And then I do the analysis I'm about to present. And then when that analysis is done, I go back and I look and see what I need to pick in order for, to get the, the, the good rates. And uh, so that's why I choose sigma because we do some analysis and then we, we tune it. And then after we've tuned it, this is the thing you get. Um, but if you kind of already know how to how to tune the constants, then then this is uh, this is a good choice to make, and so that's why I'm just putting I'm making that choice, um, and the same by the way for eta. Now, why don't how come I don't want to tell you what it, what what eta is? And there's an explicit form that you can read in the books that's spelled out, and the reason for this is because my strategy is essentially going to be for solving the bandit is essentially going to be to think of two cases. So with high probability, this inequ the inequality inside the probability is true. And so I'm going to focus on how do you use that information in order to make the best decisions for the multi-armed bandit. And of course, with low probability, the inequality is false. And uh, I'm just going to suppose that in that case, if the inequality is false, then the algorithm is just going to do something terrible and uh, it will incur high regret 
Uh, and in fact, it will occur, incur the maximum possible regret, which is linear regret with time. And uh, I'm just going to, uh, part of the reason you need to choose the constant delta and here sigma uh, to be what it is, is to ensure that the probability that the error bars fail be is uh, decays kind of quickly enough that it's asymptotically negligible. And so that's the purpose of eta. And if you want to look at those details, it's actually mostly just a technical exercise to, to figure out what that needs to be. If you want to look at those details, then have a look at the books. Um, and I'm, I'm going to assume that that part of the analysis, you know, is, 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 is just that, that everything there works. And I'm going to focus on what to do uh, with the error bars uh, conditional on them being true which uh, itself will hold with high probability. So that's the error bars. And let's just illustrate again, like what's the idea. So let's say that this is our observed data for the three arms. So what Huffington's inequality enables me to do is construct a set of error bars, essentially confidence intervals for the mean of each underlying distribution. And so here you could see that for the orange, uh, much more concentrated because we have a lot more data than for the blue. Remember that these bars are not on where you're gonna see data, they are on where the mean of the data might be given what you've seen. And so here's the same underlying distribution from previously and the means are now here. And uh, we can see that the blue mean is just a little bit higher than the orange mean. And so the optimal arm here is the blue arm. And so that's the idea that the concentration inequality is a technical tool in order to construct these, uh, these intervals. And once we've constructed these intervals, we're going to try to use them strategically in order to make the best decision so now I'm going to present to you an algorithm, and this is a classical algorithm um, dating back uh, at least 50 years, which is called the upper confidence bound algorithm. So what does it do? It says that the x of t plus 1, so then the arm you're going to play next at any time, is the argmax of a function f plus of t constructed as follows. So f plus of t and f minus of t, I'm going to define both of them, is just equal to the empirical mean for every arm, plus or minus the width of the error bars. So that's what f plus and f minus are at time t uh, that depends on the data that you've seen. And I'm just going to take my, my, the next arm to be the argmax of that function. So what's going on here? So what I'm saying is construct some error bars using the concentration inequality. Then we look at the error bars and specifically we look at the upper error bars and the arm that we're going to pick is, to, is going to be the maximum error bar. And that's what the UCB algorithm will do. Note that this is very different from picking the arm with the best empirical mean, uh, because you don't just take into account the best rewards you've seen, you also take into account the uncertainty, which is uh, controlled here by sigma. And so that's the algorithm, uh, that's UCB, that's how it works. It's kind of a very simple algorithm. And, uh, Here's the theorem. So Hufting UCBs, uh, in other words, UCB built on top of Hufting's inequality in this setting, uh, you can have a version of UCB with different concentration inequalities in many different settings, uh, but Hufting UCB's regret satisfies the following. Um, it's uh, asymptotically upper bounded by square root KT up to a logarithmic factor. So the tilde in the uh, big O is, uh, denotes a possible logarithmic factor that I'm not writing. 
And so that's the regret that Hufting UCB satisfies. Um, and this is uniformly for all possible reward distributions. Now I'm just gonna pause on that point because it's important. Uh, the, the uniformity here is with respect to the distribution of rewards. And so that means is that no matter what the, the bandit problem that I'm looking at is, it doesn't matter how difficult it is, I'm gonna have this rate. And that's actually, you can consider another analysis that you could do instead of this analysis, where instead of having a rate that's uniform for all F, you have a rate with a constant that depends on the specific rewards. In other words, you could have a scenario where if you have a more difficult bandit problem, and a reason, uh, the reason the bandit problem might be more difficult is, for example, because you have two reward distributions that are very close uh, relative to their variance. So if you have two rewards that are very close relative to their variance, then it's very hard to tell them apart. And so that's a more difficult bandit problem. Uh, and uh, in that case, you can also consider an analog of the analysis I'm gonna present, which uh, gives you rates with a constant that depends on uh, the difference between expectations, for example, or some other similar factor. And the techniques for doing that analysis are very similar to the ones that I'm gonna show. In fact, uh, it's probably, you know, you probably don't need too much extra help on top of what I'll, what I'll show in order to do that analysis yourself as an exercise, say. So uh, the techniques no are very similar and that's why I focus on this case. There was a question? Yeah, I'm sorry, small question. Uh, so um, although we have defined the regret to be deterministic, here we have expectation, and this oh, expectation me. is, this is this with is respect typo. to. This is a typo. Uh, this is a typo. Uh, there yes. shouldn't be just so it's not wrong because the regret indeed, and this is again because I've kind of tweaked these slides a bit. So I apologize. There should not be an expectation on the left hand side. It's redundant. I thought that uh, there should be expectation, but with respect to randomness of uh, the strategy, which depends on the data that we have seen so far. And oh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Sorry, I, you're actually correct. That is the, I thought I missed the typo yesterday, but I didn't miss a typo. That expectation should be there. And I'm always very worried about typos. So thanks for bringing this up, but yeah. The expectation here is with respect to the rewards that are received mm -hmm. and therefore the decisions that the strategy makes, which even if the decisions themselves are deterministic are going to be random because the rewards that you see are random. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sorry, I, I totally gave the wrong answer for, for a moment and uh, I apologize for that. So that's the expectation. Um, And so the, at least, uh, unless I've, I don't, I don't have the other definitions kind of in front of me. So, and I don't want to go all the way back then now, but the, you know, one can sort of check this later, but if you make the, even if there's like in some kind of issue here with formalism, uh, if you make the appropriate changes, everything I said will make sense. Um, and I'm just going to ask you, trust me on that <laughs> because the theory is classical. Uh, but, but, but thank you for the question. So going back to the point that I was making previously, what this result tells us is that well-calibrated error bars lead to asymptotically efficient algorithms. So in particular, if you, if you sort of use UCB as your strategy and your error bars are sort of, your concentration equality is sort of the appropriate degree of tightness, uh, that it's not just some loose inequality that nobody ever writes about because it wouldn't be interesting, then, then in, in this case, you get uh, asymptotically efficient rates for the regret. So what's, how, do you, so how do you prove this? What's, what's the idea? Um, what, what's the key idea behind this argument? Well, again, with sufficient high probability, and as I've said before, uh, 
there's going to be some small probability that this doesn't hold, and then you just send that probability to, to zero asymptotically in order to make it sort of fast enough to make its contribution negligible. But with sufficient high probability, delta, so what is delta? Delta is the regret uh, for a particular time. That's going to be upper or upper bounded um, by f plus minus f minus. And the reason for this is because with high probability, f is upper bounded by f plus and lower bounded by f minus. So minus f is upper bounded by minus f minus. So all we've done is replaced the uh, true unknown function with the error bars in our analysis. But that's upper bounded by f plus of t of x of t. Now, why is that the case? Well, that's because uh, x of t is by definition the maximum of f plus of t. So x of t is the maximum of f plus of t. And so it's bigger than any other x. And in particular, it's bigger than x star. And so we can replace the x star with the x of t. Um, but that's just, that's just two times the width of the error bars. And that's actually not an inequality, that's an equality now, um, because that's a definition of F plus and sigma. And I'm just, now we just substitute in what sigma is. And then if you set T to capital T, you get a rate um, of N to the capital T to the minus one half. So this is the key idea behind how to analyze UCB is to think about it in this way. So again, here we've used the fact that the uh, error bars contain the true, uh, true underlying uh, rewards with high probability. And we've used the fact that uh, because you choose X of T to maximize F plus of T, then therefore F plus of X of T is, uh, bigger than ft of x, and this is true for all x and all t in, in both cases. So those are the, those are the, those are what we've used. And so here, now what does this tell us? What is the, what, what I, what, what's the idea behind uh, this, uh, this uh, analysis, uh, very simple analysis? Well, and what does it tell us? What's the result? So from this, we know that the regret that each arm incurs is related through an inequality to the number of times that it's chosen. And in particular, if nt is big, then nt to the minus one half is small. And so if you choose an arm many times, then its regret must be small. And so that's a, that's a very important observation. And if you make that observation, you know, you're actually quite far in, um, in proving the bound that I showed you earlier. Um, this observation is kind of enough to, to suspect that, you know, maybe you'll get real regret, um, but we wanna do more than that. We wanna know what the rate is gonna be. Um, and so again, I'm just gonna illustrate kind of the, 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 the meaning of this calculation. So here's our data, here's our error bars. And if we look at the error bars, then the amount of times that we're going to pick an arm um, is going to be related to the width of the error bars, which are shown here. So that's what we, that's what we learn by doing the analysis that um, I showed you on the previous page. Okay, so with this in mind, let's finish the argument. Um, and so then you consider the uh, expected regret with respect to random rewards. Uh, and now that's, that's just the, again, the regret. And I'm reminding you here that that's what the deltas are. The deltas is the X, X star minus X of T. Um, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write that sum in a different way. Um, so the previous sum is just the sum of the regret at each time point um, over all the times. 
but that's the same thing as summing the regret uh, for every arm multiplied by the number of times that each arm is chosen. So all I've done here is uh, rearrange the sum and combined terms uh, in the first summation, combined terms that all involve the same arm and multiply by the number of times the arm is chosen. So this, this sort of, this, this is the, the fact that this is an equality is sort of, it's pretty obvious. Um, and, and again, the, the meaning of this is that uh, the, I have the, the regret is, this, is the sum from, of the difference between the optimal arm and the arm I picked over all the time steps. And that's the same thing as looking as the regret for every arm times the number of times that I play that arm. So that, that's all that happened here. It's just a rearranging of the sum. Um, and the previous uh, slide tells me that this delta is uh, uh, up to a logarithmic factor uh, square root rate. And so what do I do then? Well, I just combine those terms uh, and I apply that inequality. And I get, I get, I get, I get this uh, particular expression. But this is now, you know, pretty simple. I take the uh, big O with the tilde, I pull it out of the sum, uh, and then I apply essentially a consequence of Jensen's inequality, and get a uh, square root, basically to take that square root and pull it outside the sum. But because I'm an applying the analog of Jensen's inequality, uh, I get this uh, k factor for the number of terms inside the sum. Recall that the size of x is k. And so there are k uh, terms inside the sum. And so that's where, why the k appears, because that's, that's what the inequality says. Um, uh, but that's just uh, uh, big O with uh, the tilde of square root kt. And the reason for this is because if you look at the sum, the sum over all the arms of the number of times each arm was pulled, well, that's just the total amount of time you've played. That's just the total amount of time all the arms have been pulled, which is equal to the total amount of time you've been, you've been playing. And so that's why that sum is equal to t. So again, sort of this analysis is very straightforward, very elementary even. Um, and, and there's the result. Uh, and um, if you really want to make like all of this completely formal, you have to deal with, well, what if the, what if the inequality doesn't hold and all these like more or less like formal matters. Um, but the key idea is this, it's to think of the get, getting a relationship between the regret of each arm and the number of times the algorithm picks it. And then once you have that relationship, essentially just plug it into uh, these expressions and apply some sort of basic analysis and get uh, the rate that I've written here. So that's the, and that's, that, that, that's essentially the, the whole, that's the whole idea behind the argument. And if you want the full precise argument, uh, it's, it's in all the books that I'll, that, I'll, that I'll list later. So that's really all I, the main ideas I wanted to present. And so I wanna just conclude uh, sort of the last part of the talk by talking about some extensions of these ideas. The first extension is uh, you can be more careful and more like clever with your, uh, essentially with what kind of exactly how you deal with the concentration inequalities that's, that's the primary factor. And as a consequence of being more careful, you can remove the logarithmic component from the rate. And this is true, not just for the Bernoulli bandit that I've presented, it's also true, or excuse me for this bandit with the, not the Bernoulli bandit, it's the, the bandit with the uh, rewards in the unit interval. It's actually true uh, more generally for uh, bandits with uh, uh, sub, with rewards that are real valued, as long as the reward distribution is a sub-Gaussian. 
And the proof of that case is very similar. It's the, the idea behind it is, is, is identical to the idea that I presented. The only difference is now you need to be much more sophisticated as to how you do sort of the concentration analysis, how you actually construct the error bars. And uh, the, there's, there's quite a bit more like sophistication that goes into the strength, into like making that argument give you that rate. Uh, but the key idea behind it, the key idea and the, the kind of analysis you do to begin with is, is essentially the same. And so that's, that's the first extension of these ideas. Um, and in particular, that allows you to, for bandits with finitely many arms, that allows you to have essentially the same result in much more general setting where you, you don't assume that the rewards are, are bounded. Um, and so another uh, factor with that is uh, you can even consider generalizations where uh, ultimately the kind of concentration equality you use is going to depend on tail behavior. And so like one way to get a rate that's actually different from any of these is to consider like a heavy tailed bandit, for example, that that's another generalization you could consider. And in that case, you may not get a square root rate. You might get uh, some other rate. Depends on the details of your problem. Uh, the next thing I want to mention that's out there that people are thinking about is uh, adversarial and contextual bandits. So adversarial bandit, um, this is a bit loose notation, but essentially adversarial bandit is the problem where you want, you want to maximize the reward. And then someone else is deciding what kind of data to give you, and they are going to give you the most confusing possible data to get the smallest reward. And so you need to kind of be like very cautious about kind of what you consider in the data because you're trying to maximize the reward but they're trying to confuse you as much as possible. And so that's the adversarial bandits. And uh, you know, and, and in that case, actually nothing is random, everything is deterministic. Um, and uh, you can think of this as kind of a uh, two-player, uh, zero-sum kind of game type setting. So, and in those cases, actually, UCB is uh, sort of not the optimal thing to do. But the pr the principles still are, are, are still not that different. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that that's a generalization people think about. And in particular, another generalization on top of that is the contextual bandit. Now, in the contextual bandit is an adversarial bandit, but there is also some set of side information that's available to you. So you're trying to maximize the rewards and the adversary is trying to confuse you as much as possible, but then you have access to some hidden information about the arms that's presented to you at every iteration that you can sort of use to, uh, to defeat the adversary. And so that's the contextual bandit. Um, contextual bandit turns out to be very interesting um, in part because it's uh, sort of one step between bandits and reinforcement learning. And I'm going to mention reinforcement learning later. Um, the next extension I want to think about is uh, Bayesian analogs of all of these things and Thompson sampling in particular. So uh, what is Thompson sampling? Thompson sampling is a strategy, uh, it's a different strategy than UCB. And Thompson sampling says to pick the uh, next uh, time step x of t plus one to be the argmax of um, a function phi. And uh, what is this function phi? Well, the function phi is actually a random function that comes from posterior distribution of the uh, rewards given the data that you've observed. And so Thompson sampling is a random strategy and uh, it's and you can consider uh, analyzing its regret with the very similar techniques to the ones I've presented. Now Thompson sampling is particularly interesting to analyze where you don't just analyze the regret, you analyze the Bayesian regret. And the Bayesian regret is the uh, expected regret under the prior distribution that uh, you select for your uh, posterior to construct your posterior. 
So, and you can do a uh, very similar analysis in that case. The detail is a little bit different, but the key ideas are essentially the same for showing. And, and for this particular problem, um, if I recall right, Thompson sampling gets the same rate that UCB does. So you get essentially a square root rate uh, as well for, for that problem. Uh, so they're, they're both sort of different strategies. Uh, and one of them is a deterministic strategy. The other is a random strategy. And they both have sort of asymptotically very similar performance. Now, on a, on a real world problem, they might have different performance because of uh, uh, behavior that's outside of the asymptotics. And so Thompson sampling is often used, for example, if you want to, you have a multi-armed bandit and you want to do a parallel bandit. So at every iteration, you don't just select one arm, you, se you, you select multiple arms. Uh, and so in that case, Thompson sampling is very nice, but it's very easy to generalize to that setting. Instead of drawing one X of T plus one, you just draw like a cup, like, some finite number of them and uh, pick all of those arms. And so for, and so Thompson sampling has very nice parallel behavior and that's why, that's one reason you might want to use it instead of UCB. Um, but uh, in, even though empirically, if you just use it in like one, one at a time compared to UCB empirically, it, maybe it, it does a bit worse, but uh, this is due to constant factors. But then you can do parallels, so it, it's it's just another kind of useful tool to have uh, and a useful algorithm to know about in this setting. Um, and the final thing I want to mention in the bandit extensions is uh, this uh, problem called partial monitoring. So uh, what I learned about the problem called partial monitoring, I thought to myself, you know, this is very similar to dynamic programming because uh, and Richard Bellman famously named dynamic programming. Uh, he called it dynamic programming because it was a name that was uh, that was so generic that not even a Congress person could object to it. <laughs> That's kind of the famous story. Um, and so partial monitoring is also of this flavor. It's it's a name that is so generic that not even a uh, politician could object to it. <laughs> and I, I think that's uh, I think that's quite humorous. Um, but uh, so what, what? So what's partial monitoring? Partial monitoring is uh, an extension of adversarial bandit, where you never observe the rewards at all, and you don't even observe a noisy version or an adversarial version of the rewards. Instead, there is an uh, observation operator that determines what you observe, and in particular, you might observe you might pick one arm, but then uh, your observation may tell you something about other arms. So in all of these settings uh, I, that I've considered so far, sort of all of the arms are separate from each other. And uh, if you observe reward about one arm, that doesn't tell you anything about the other arms. But in partial monitoring, if you observe, you might, in, in, in particular, you might have an arm where if you play that arm, you get very small reward. Maybe you even get no reward but you learn a lot about other arms. And so because of that, that extension I think is very interesting. And it turns out that UCB is not optimal for partial monitoring and Thompson sampling is not optimal for partial monitoring, um, but there is an extension called information directed sampling, which is optimal for partial monitoring in an appropriate sense. And information directed sampling is an extension of Thompson sampling where the uh, instead of um, choosing the arm with the uh, sort of best uh, regret according to your posterior distribution, you choose it according to the best regret um, reweighted by uh, the uh, mutual information between your uh, the, between the arm and the optimal arm, all according to the posterior. So it sort of incorporates this information theoretic kind of idea. And that turns out to uh, deal with the problem of, uh, say you have an arm that doesn't give you very much reward, but it gives you a lot of information about other rewards. And so then there might be, and so, and so that turns out to sort of uh, reweight 
the probabilities in the right way to give you uh, good, 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 good performance. And uh, that's a, it's a really interesting algorithm, which is actually new. It's only proposed kind of um, in at some point in the last 10 years, if I recall right, uh, certainly not much beyond far beyond that. So the analysis and like full study of that algorithm is sort of only beginning to be developed and there's active research in, in this area. Um, and so that's partial monitoring. Um, and the final idea that generalizes all of these things that I wanna talk about is reinforcement learning. And so in reinforcement learning, there is an agent that interacts in an environment to receive some kind of reward. And so here you see the agent that has to, has to go to the door and grab the key and get to the final state. And so uh, what does this have to do with bandits? Well, in reinforcement learning, the key thing is that this is very similar to optimal control, but in reinforcement learning, you don't know. You don't know the transition dynamics. So you don't know how the actions, and here the actions are like rotate left, rotate right, move forward, uh, press the button to try to open the door. Th those are the actions. You don't know how those actions will affect future states. And in particular, because of that, you don't know what the rewards are. And depending on how you formulate precisely, the environment might be stochastic or the rewards might be stochastic. And uh, both of these are possible. And uh, because of, uh, of this, you know, you sort of get an explore exploit trade off in this setting that's very similar to the setting in bandits. And it turns out that UCB generalizes to this setting as well. You can, instead of building error bars on the reward distribution of arms, you can build uh, analogous like confidence sets on the uh, set of possible transition dynamics or on the value of different states and um, or on you know, the things like Q functions, if you're familiar with those. And so because of this, uh, UCB can also be used in this setting and at least, and whether or not it's optimal depends a lot on the details of exactly how you uh, formulate and formalize kind of the setting and the precise assumptions. There sort of is a lot more choices to be made as to how to set the problem up here than in the bandit case. And those choices lead to like a very rich set of possible theory as to what kind of regret bounds your algorithm gets. Um, these ideas are sort of, there's a lot of work being done on this area now, and I think they're, they're not at all like completely understood. So this is, uh, you know, another like uh, area of active research. And so I want to conclude now with some references. Uh, here's, there's a very nice book by uh, Alexander Slifkin uh, on, which is called An Introduction to Multi-Armed Bandits which is sort of a very accessible introduction. So if you're new to this topic, this is the book that I would recommend because it's very accessible, it's very intuitive. Um, he spends a good bit of time dealing with the algorithms that are different than UCB just because to help like establish some intuition about different strategies and how the analysis of different strategies is kind of similar. Um, he also proves the uh, lower bound that I didn't say almost anything about in this talk. And so that's a very nice book to get started. And then there is, of course, the uh, sort of much more encyclopedic reference by Tor Lattimore and Shaba Sapasavari, which has all the like sophisticated analysis and sort of state of the art results and like the best bounds that people know about that sort of takes quite a bit of work to develop. And so there's a, there's a very large amount of inequalities in that book. Um, and a lot of like quite technical analysis to, to get the uh, optimal behavior. And it's a very nice reference. Uh, and that reference also has a lot of like these expanded settings like partial monitoring. Um, if, you wanna, if you want a reference on partial monitoring, you, know, you, can, you can find it in that book. And that's a very nice book. And I think these are the two uh, canonical references on uh, this subject, at least that, that I've used in the preparation of these ideas and in kind of learning about multi-armed bandits as I've been doing in recent times, which is what prompted me to give this tutorial to uh, maybe tell you a little bit about some of the ideas that I've, I've, I've learned about in the past uh, 
the past uh, the past months in the past year. Um, and so that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much for the attention. Um, here's my site. Uh, there's a link to these slides on the site. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, um, and I'm often tweeting about stuff with machine learning. Um, I'm based at Imperial College, um, and uh, yeah, I see that we ended a little bit uh, earlier, um, but this is, I think, fine, because then that means there is time for discussion and questions. So uh, I'm happy to take any discussion and questions and uh consider them any typos or any of the extensions if somebody wants to know more about that. Uh, so yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you, Alex.